Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Srinivar of uh, Machine Learning in Chemistry and Chemical Process at ACE. As you all know, ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers that have gathered around topics like AI research, engineering, and products. And we host uh, usually uh, free live uh, sessions like uh, three to five times a week with a variety of subjects. If uh, you're interested, you can always visit uh, ai.science website to get uh, all of those uh, uh, talks and get to know more about the ACE. Also, make sure you sub subscribe to the YouTube channel so uh, you can get ML papers explained. You can get more talks like this in the future, and also you can have access to the uh, collection of the videos that we have already recorded. We are currently we currently have uh, many stream owners focused on very various ML topics, uh, and this is ML in a chemistry and chemical process stream. So I uh, hope you enjoy this talk today. Our guest is Dr. Alex Zilapkin. And uh, it, uh, it is a great pleasure to have him uh, as speaker. He uh, got his uh, chemistry degree from Novosibirsk uh, State University in Russia, uh, chemical engineering PhD from University of Bulk in the field of uh, catalytic uh, reaction engineering. And then he got academic position in chemical engineering in the same university since 2000 and appointed full professor of chemical engineering at the University of Warwick in 2009, and elected to the current uh, position of professor sustainable reaction engineering at Cambridge. Uh, and he is now, uh, uh, he has several jobs, including being a director of innovation center in digital uh, molecular technologies and deputy director of uh, center of for doctoral studies. And he is going to give us a talk about combining physical models with machine learning and robotic uh, technology to develop complex chemical processes. Okay, thanks again, Dr. Lockin, and uh, we can't wait to hear from you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to talk. As you see, I've changed my title a little bit, so I'm going to talk about the uh, the same topic. I'll just reformulate it, the the title a little bit. It's the work. With, the majority of this work is done in our Singapore-based uh, research center. It's called Cambridge Center for Advanced Research and Education in Singapore, and part of this work is done in our lab in in Cambridge. So what I will talk about is uh, how to use or why do we use Bayesian process optimization in automated chemical systems, how we uh, set up a system to benchmark different machine learning optimizations for a specific chemistry problems, how we then um, use similar techniques in optimization of formulations, and then a little bit at the end about what I think are the remaining challenge for machine learning and for the whole field of uh, digitalizing chemistry. So first of all, what, I, what do I mean uh, by optimization of processes and why do we use machine learning? Where does it sit in the process development cycle for us? I'm talking about um, manufacture and um, optimization of processes and optimization of products uh, rather than about discovery. And in this uh, workflow, what we are trying to do is to increase the speed of arriving at a scalable, manufacturable process when um, all of the parameters for the process are optimized, including continuous variables and uh, discrete variables. Uh, this field is now about 10 years old. Um, uh, the first paper I know about this field is from the group of Martin Polyakov, from, which is published in 2011. Um, then there were a few reviews about the, this, this topic. Our review is now six years old, from 2015. Uh, perhaps the best one I like is the review from Eli Lilly. This is uh, in 2019 in Reaction Chemistry and Engineering. So in this automated um, 
process optimization, you have a number of components. You have an experiment, which is a reactor, uh, which needs to be fully automated. Uh, it takes measurements, it performs the reactions, it performs separations. Uh, the measurements are then converted into something meaningful using chemoinformatics. So we understand what, what have the, um, the system achieved. Then on the basis of this experimental observations, we need to create new hypotheses about the next experiments to perform. So this is where active learning comes into play. And this is where we need a brain and where the machine learning algorithms come in. So this is uh, our current system. Uh, it's uh, recently been published in the new journal from Wiley Chemistry Methods. It consists of a um, commercial uh, uh, continuous flow chemistry setup. So the, the, the bits in the middle are the reactor modules and the pumping modules, which are easily automatable because these commercial systems comes with an API you can address all of the components and you can run it uh, from pretty much any software you like. In order to feed the system with um, designed experiments, so you can choose the discrete variables, you can choose reagents, solvents, catalysts, uh, we uh, put some of the components in reverse. So in this case, we have a liquid handling robot, which is typically used to collect the product fractions. We use it both to collect the product fraction, but also to create the feed mixtures into which are fed into the reactor. So you set up your um, feed solutions in the rack and then program the robot to create the right mixtures based on the designed experiments. And then those go into the, into the reactor system. We perform the reactions in flow, but we perform them in droplets so that we don't waste expensive reagents. The size of the droplet is limited by dispersion in the pipe. If the dispersion is too high, you cannot have very small droplets. So you typically have those quite large slugs. Uh, so they are um, in, 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 a, in a pipe and the slug volume is, is about three milliliters or so. Uh, if you go a little bit smaller, then you might um, have the effect of dispersion on the, on the results. To analyze the results, we have uh, an online HPLC instrument. And if you want to, you can also call it with the mass spec. Some other people have uh, coupled this with infrared or with uh, even inline NMR. So all of these things are entirely possible. That depends on your budget and on the specific chemistry problem you want to study. So the entire system is connected uh, to one um, system which runs the whole thing, which programs everything, times the analysis, um, time and um, runs the runs the machine. So um, this is our current iteration. On this slide, I'll show you our first iteration of the same thing, uh, which is in our old lab. It looks quite more, much more rugged than this. Uh, fewer boxes, uh, but it still worked. Um, we published it a few years ago. Uh, it's it's very similar design. Again, the same vapor tech machine or similar. Um, again, sampling from a line, but in this case using GC. Um, and we used a, a very, uh, I would say, ingenious uh, way of uh, running the GC by basically programming a mouse to click the run instead of um, doing anything else. That was the cheapest way of doing automation in this case. Um, very much um, student led project. So to run this, we use Bayesian optimization. We use algorithms uh, which construct a surrogate function, uh, which estimate what's going to be the, uh, the outcome. We then try to minimize the uncertainty of the model and target the regions of the experimental space where the uncertainty is the largest. So this is the standard way of, of running uh, this type of um, optimization problems. We use Gauss and processes typically, they are very good for chemistry. Uh, they work in most of the cases. They work with sparse data sets. They don't require uh, a lot of data. And um, besides the fact that we can uh, have the uncertainty um, explicitly helps in designing the, the workflow for active learning. So that, that, that's the reason why in many of the studies of this type, 
people use uh, Gaussian processes as a surrogate model. We use this chemistry as an example. We don't need to go into detail what it is. Uh, the only thing which is important, there are several outcomes which depend on the process conditions. So you change process conditions, you get slightly different uh, outcome. And then uh, the system is nonlinear and uh, you have a number of possible targets. You can target the minimum cost. You can also target the maximum yield, for example. Um, and uh, the results are not necessarily the same. So the system is, is, is a nonlinear system. In order to set up any automated system, you need to give it limits. And this is the question we always get asked, how do we set it up? Can the system run entirely autonomously uh, or you require some kind of um, uh, knowledge from uh, experts? Uh, and yes, of course, you do require some knowledge. You need to make sure that the system runs within its physical limits in terms of temperature, pressure, flow rates of the of the system. But then also uh, we run this in flow, which means that we're limited by running everything in, in liquid form. We try to avoid solids due to the type of equipment we use. If you change the equipment, you can do exactly the same using different setups which can handle solids. And in this case, you're not that limited by the range of solubilities. We also use prior chemical knowledge. So we use knowledge on, let's say, ratio of reagents. And in one of the examples which I show you, we also use um, a prior model to uh, before we do optimization. But we'll, we'll come to that uh, a little bit later. So we have our tables with the optimization limits. We set uh, also the ratios of reagents, which we know make sense. So it doesn't, it's in, in, it, it doesn't make sense to go outside of those. It's not going to work at all. And we also give the system uh, the knowledge of the costs of the reagents. So that's how we calculate the minimum um, cost of the, of the process. Now, um, I presume I'm talking predominantly with people who understand machine learning. However, the users of uh, our methodology are people who typically understand chemistry. And so in order to combine this two, we've created a user interface, which is actually speaks to chemists um, with the language they understand. So uh, any experienced chemist could come up to this machine and actually set up an experiment without having to uh, do any programming themselves. It's all done uh, at the back. So it starts with the launching the, the connection to the flow experiments, then define an optimization space. What do you actually optimize and what are the limits for those? Then um, looking at uh, the analytical parameters for the system, then selecting the scale. So how, what's the size of the droplet you're using? Then looking at, okay, what do you actually gonna optimize? Are you gonna optimize for yield, for, selec for selectivity, for environmental impact, for cost? Typically we optimize for two targets simultaneously. You, we have now a version uh, on this screen, it only allows you to select two. We have a version where you can select three or four uh, simultaneous objectives. And we use a, a multi-objective uh, algorithm, which I mentioned. Then you can train the model. And this is, you either use the data you already had and you just up, uh, upload an Excel file or you uh, generate um, a, uh, a prior and we use Latin hypercube for that. Um, and you can use another initial design if you want. For some cases, if you're doing kinetic experiments, it's it, uh, Latin hypercube is not the best way. Typically, Latin hypercube works. It's not always the most efficient prior, but it is sort of the, the prior data set, training data set, but it's, it seems to work okay. And then you start optimization and the system works. It also shows the current results, the past results, the current optimum, and you can always get the, the data out and have a look at what's going on. So let me show how it works. Here, uh, we're optimizing 
for cost and yield. So we want the highest yield, which is on the right, and we want the lowest cost, which is on the top. So the cost is in, in, in reverse in the axis. So the optimals will be on the right top corner. And our training set is the, the, the circles and the optimization set is then uh, will be the crosses. So initially we run the training experiments. This is like Latin hypercube designed and they obviously explore the space. Um, so they are all over the space. And then you start running the actual optimization experiments which are then congregating fairly close at where the optimal solutions are. So as you can see, they're fairly densely um, concentrated at the top right, top right line, top line and uh, top right corner. So this line is the set of Parita optimal solutions. So all of the solutions there are correct. They're all optimal and you just need to choose the one you like. Uh, so you obviously you're going to choose some, uh, something a bit further to the right where you have high yield because the costs don't vary that much. So somewhere there you would have the, uh, the solutions uh, you would want to pick. So this is how this works. So this was done in uh, um, 67 experiments. They were run by the machine without uh, any interference. So 20 training experiments and then 47 uh, optimization experiments. The rather complicated infographic is really for people, if you really want to see that the system is nonlinear, then uh, you can see it here that there are data points where the yield is high, the cost is not optimal, and vice versa when the yield is low and the cost is, 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 low, uh, is, is low as well. So it's, it's a not, not uh, a linear uh, system which is easy to optimize, for which this would just be a waste of time. So out of curiosity, um, the researchers who built the system and did this work, um, Simon and Mohammed, decided to break it. Uh, well, they didn't, come, they, they didn't write the algorithm, they, they put together the whole system. And so they decided to give it very, very little training data. So instead of 20 data points for Latin Hypercube, they gave it two and decided to say, okay, how does it gonna fare? And they run it for 130 total experiments. So these are the first two data points. They're in the middle of the yields, but those are actually recent yields for this reaction at different costs. And then the, uh, the TSE model algorithm we are using actually have to explore a lot more in order to get to the right set of solutions. And it, does actually fare reasonably well. It still finds quite a lot of data. It, it's not as dense as before, but it's not bad at all. So then they were encouraged by the fact that they couldn't break it. So they decided instead of giving it the yields, which are already reasonably good, uh, try to give two data points, which are really very bad. So they decided to give uh, data points, which are very low. So in this case, the yields are very low. So this is the first one, then that's the second one again. And then of course the system is very, the, the algorithm doesn't have any data about where the right solutions are. So the exploration then takes longer. So the, uh, the data points go all over the place and still in the late optimization runs, the, uh, you see that it begins to concentrate around the Parita set of solutions somewhere in the top. So what is encouraging for us is at this stage in the state of the art of the automated optimization, you can pick uh, a now off the shelf algorithm. We are using TSEMO. Uh, which has been adopted by a few groups. It's open access. You can download it. You can re-implement it. Uh, we've re-implemented from MATLAB into Python and um, automate the commercial equipment using fairly standard automation setup. It's everything is automated to LabVIEW and uh, run experiments. In this case, 130 experiments. It's several days of work. It's almost a week. And um, 
this, the, the machine works on its own. It only will send an error message if something is wrong, like a pub stopped or uh, the um, um, a, a solution bottle ran out of solution. Now, in order to understand which algorithm to actually use, we, uh, my group decided to look at standard types of problems, which many chemists or process chemists um, face, and then look at the number of algorithms out there and see, okay, can we develop a tool which helps users to understand what's the best algorithm for a specific problem, so-called benchmarking problem. Uh, they've set up this code, which is called Summit. It's again, it's on GitHub, it's open. The review, the chem archive paper is out and the uh, peer reviewed paper is already in production. It will come out in the same chemistry methods journal um, quite soon. Um, so what this uh, system does, it picks um, an algorithm which the user chooses to try it has a set of standard problems uh, which are already encoded uh, based on physical models as well as uh, based on uh, machine learning models and then uh, runs the optimization compares the different algorithms in several metrics and then gives you the uh, the comparison so let's just see how it works so uh, you can upload your own experimental data for this and uh, your own chemical system, and then try to run it to uh, see how, how well a particular machine learning strategy works for, for this. So the, uh, the mechanistic models which can be used uh, are basically differential equations. So they would be continuous functions typically. And if you have a machine learning representation, then uh, it would be um, a, some kind of surrogate which represents the, the real system. So if we look at an example, this is a literature example, which uh, has a machine learning model behind it. Um, so there is a known data set. Uh, it's a multi-objective optimization. Again, you have space time yield and environmental factor as objective. You have four uh, decision variables and um, for types of decision variables, concentration or concentrations, equivalence, um, time and temperature. And you see how dense is the data. So it's actually quite a lot of data. So there is a neural network which uh, is uh, behind this, uh, this tool, behind this reaction as a surrogate. And then once you run the, um, the comparison, the benchmark in, in this specific case, the TSEMO algorithm seems to be better. So you see that it reaches the highest hypervolume in the smallest number of experiments on the right hand side. So the, the larger is the hypervolume, the better is the, uh, the model. But if you look at the comparison uh, with also the computational time, TSEMO algorithm in this uh, left panel is, is the, the rightmost. Uh, two bars, it's actually quite uh, hungry with computational time. It's not the hungriest, but it is quite um, uh, hungry. And so for some of the problems, you may not want to use such an algorithm. You want, may want to use an algorithm which may be not as accurate, but also not as computationally expensive. And some algorithms are much worse. Uh, in, in this specific case, for example, Chimera, um, have a, a, a low accuracy and high computational costs. Some others are, are not that bad. So if we have other benchmarking studies when on different cases, other algorithms are actually performing better than TSEMO. So it's, uh, it's the tool which allows to do this comparison. In the last part of the talk, and I actually have about three minutes left for what I gave myself, but I'll probably take a little bit more. I wanted to talk about how we use similar uh, approach to optimize formulations. Just to say, what are the formulations? Formulations are complex mixtures of ingredients, your shampoos, uh, lots of other consumer products, many of the foods, pharmaceuticals, coatings, agrochemicals, all of those are uh, formulations. Um, they are 
they have many ingredients. They are require they require complex processing. They have specific requirements for shelf life. They have specific requirements for evolution of the properties in their use. If you think about shampoo, for example, um, we thought about using some kind of evolutionary approach to design and fabrica uh, fabrication of formulations quite a while back. So we published this concept paper about how we would possibly do it from biofeedstock a while ago, but we couldn't do it. We didn't have enough uh, tools for that um, several years ago. So this is the new tool which we've just published. Uh, the paper came out just a couple of weeks ago. Um, what it does, it takes a robotic system which can make the formulations. It uses two algorithms. One is a, classif a classifier, which um, is trained on pre-trained on some data. And it basically says, is your formulation you're going to make going to be stable or unstable? And you want a stable formulation, so it's stable in, in use. And then the second um, part is the regression model, which is, again, we use TSEMO, uh, where we then optimize in the composition to get the right viscosity and also the lowest price. So in this case, we actually have three targets. We want a stable formulation, which has low price and has low viscosity. And then we run this whole thing as, um, as an optimization approach. So this is a collaboration with the group of Leroy Cronin in Glasgow. They build uh, low cost uh, chemical robots. So this is the, the way how this robot looks. The, the left hand side robot is the one which is making formulations. So it basically pumps, which feed solutions in the right uh, ratio into the vials. Then we take the vials for processing. We haven't automated this step yet, it's been done. And then we put it in a second robot, which is a measurement robot. It has some sensors and there are uh, the viscosity measurements are done in a, in a different system just outside. So uh, first we trained a naive Bayes classifier to predict whether the uh, composition chosen by the algorithm is going to be stable or not stable. We've proven that the naive classifier, naive Bayes classifier is probably the best for this uh, task. And um, it certainly works better than the, the random sampling. Then after that, uh, after the um, classifier was done, then we started regression. And um, the regression uh, within 12 iterations, it no longer suggests any unstable formulations. So it still, still passes some through the classifier. It still samples the space where you can have uh, unstable formulations, but it's now looking for three targets, um, low turbidity, stable formulations, and low price. And so uh, low turbidity is also low viscosity. It corresponds in this case. Um, so the regression algorithm helps in getting to uh, formulations which are stable. And then if we look at how the entire optimization space looks like, um, this is a comparison of the um, data points collected by the train algorithm, which is the blue crosses, the experimental optimal solutions where we think is where the optimal solutions are, these red dots, and the initial design and the black squares. So you see the initial design is all over the place. Again, it's Latin hypercube. And then the um, optima are the experiments where uh, we're really sure that those are uh, the good uh, experimental data points, and then the TSEMO is the um, trained uh, optimal um, solutions of the Parita. In this case, it's a rather complex Parita surface. Um, it's highly nonlinear space, but what was interesting in this study, we managed to find a number of formulations in half the experiments, a number of formulations which are better uh, lower viscosity and lower price compared to what the experimentalists could find just using purely uh, factorial, cl classical factorial design uh, without any machine learning uh, in half of the time, uh, in terms of half the number of experiments. So this is everything I wanted to show. Um, what remains uh, for us to do and where we put in most of our effort today 
is to try to fully digitize the workflow for laboratories. And this includes standardization of the way we record, store, and access data. We then want to have a space for AI agents to play effectively. Our machine learning algorithms we treat as agents. And so we need to have the environment in which the agents could recognize where the data are, what the data are, and how to work with this data. And then um, on the specific chemistry challenges, the next challenge is the multi-step processes where it's not a single step, but two, three, four, ten steps in the process which need to be optimized for a global optimum rather than local optimum. This is the real challenge for the DOE algorithms. Um, so I've shown you that the single step optimizations are now, I would say, pretty much routine. Um, the automation of lab experiments can be done fairly straightforwardly. It's not very expensive to do. Um, we, work multi, we work with multi-objective Bayesian optimizations. They seem to be quite effective. Um, the system we are now further developing for multi-step reaction separation sequences. We've shown that same Bayesian optimization can also be used in finding optimal formulation recipes. And then the challenge is to create this ecosystem of agents and data to have a fully integrated digital workflow. So I'll leave you with the acknowledgements of my uh, industrial partners, uh, the funders, public funders in the UK and in Singapore, and also the, um, uh, the acknowledgement of the contribution of students who are involved with the Syntec uh, Doctoral Training Center. I'll stop here. Sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, I really enjoyed it and it was very impressive. Uh, and uh, just a few questions uh, about the work that you have done. I, it appears to me that you used uh, con constraint nonlinear optimization. So would you mind uh, mm -hmm. just uh, explaining a little bit more uh, the algorithm that you used for optimization? So we use um, an algorithm which is called TSIMO. We published it a few years ago. It's based on um, using a surrogate function. So we train uh, Gaussian processes. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you need to sample from Gaussian processes so that you effectively create a very so sample to create predictions so that you have the Bayesian approach. But then you also need to make sure that you do not have an excessive sampling so that you don't run too many experiments. So you need to balance uh, looking for an optimum and getting the right statistical function. So exploration versus exploitation. Then you can set up a certain acquisition function. There are a variety of acquisition functions which could be done. Um, we used entropy in the first one, uh, then uh, we use uh, different functions later on. It almost doesn't matter which one. It's basically computational efficiency, which gives you the, uh, the choice of the acquisition function. And then you need to also choose how you sample. In the first algorithm we use, we basically had a grid search. We said, OK, we're going to sample 1,000 points uh, in the grid, which is OK. But you don't always need to do that. It's sometimes excessive, so you're doing uh, excessive work. So in TSIMA, the sampling is done, it's so-called Thompson sampling, so it's a spectral sampling technique, um, which allows us to more efficiently sample from the uh, GPs to get the, uh, the overall model. So that's basically the way how, how this works. Mm -hmm. It's a non-parametric stochastic optimization. Mm -hmm. And I saw in your slides that reinforcement learning is part of the model, or at least is going to be part of the model. So it is, uh, is it based on this optimization or is going to be used for this uh, to finding the like uh, probably global minima or is for some other part of the system? So reinforcement learning, we already implemented as a tool uh, to search for optimal um, 
policies to design uh, superstructures in process development. So the paper have come out about a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's a lot of people are interested in reinforcement learning also as an optimization technique. And so we will um, include the uh, RL module into this uh, benchmarking just because some people want to use it. Uh, it's not the most, it's probably the least efficient one. Uh, but because people are interested in RL, we are working to include that into the, into the uh, summit package. Okay. So it will be there. It's not there yet. It's almost finished. Uh, we just need to debug it and then it will be released. Wow, that's fantastic. And I saw that like, I'm guessing that you're using kind of a, a, like binary classification to decide whether it's stable or not. So can you elaborate mm -hmm. what uh, criteria you're uh, specifically using to decide whether it's stable or not? Is it just physical properties like temperature and pressure disconnected, or there are some other? It's visual. Uh, this is how it's done in industry. Um, formulations are characterized by the stability over time, and it's basically your observation of the change of turbidity over time. So mm -hmm. the unstable formulation will basically layer out. And uh, if you have an expensive experiment, you have uh, cameras which take images with different exposures and different lighting. We take one image, uh, so our measurements are not very accurate, but they still give us uh, give us an indication. So we have an image with image analysis and we have a turbidity sensor. So we take these two measurements together. Whereas in commercial setups for analysis of stability, they measure turbidity and they measure multiple images which they combine together into a, um, uh, a single indicator later on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, finally, uh, for the software that you are using, like uh, you showed us the graphical interface uh, for someone who is not uh, familiar with machine learning concept. So is it commercialized or uh, like how, if people want to use it or at least work with it, uh, how, how is the process? Like so um, the paper has, yeah, the paper with this work is now out. It's open access. The MATLAB version of this algorithm and the interface is published on the GitHub for anybody to pick up. But of course, you need to have MATLAB license to do that. So mm -hmm. uh, we have recoded everything in Python and uh, the entire interface together with the algorithm behind it, the optimization setup, and the communication with the uh, vendor instruments is now available in Python. It's not yet public. Uh, it's done within the project which has involvement of uh, a bunch of, well, the companies listed here on the left, MSG, GSK, Pfizer, Syngenta. And mm -hmm. we have a question with them about whether uh, when they would allow us to release it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. At the moment, it's being considered for adoption with these companies, um, uh, but I think they don't really want to own it. So we will release it um, as soon as we sort out how. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay, so it's, uh, it's going to be, at least for now, it's going to be a, a free open access and people can have access to it through Get, GitHub, right? That's correct, yes. Yep, sounds good. I think that was pretty much it for the questions. I, again, I thank you uh, for uh, giving this uh, talk. It was really impressive and interesting. And thanks everyone for joining us today and hope to see you in the future talks and events. Thank you for organizing, it's a pleasure.